characteristic of the tween. Um, <laughs> they, are, they have really good sides and there are things which can be um, improved. Um, uh, first of all, um, I think it would be uh, uh, I think it has to be noted, first of all, that uh, the number of companies which are taking part um, has increased very much. And after all, this is the acid test, I would say, of uh, the uh, protection uh, of uh, uh, granted by the safe harbor. We now have uh, 30,000 companies which are part of uh, uh, this uh, scheme. And again, uh, uh, our message today is uh, 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 it has a merit to exist. Uh, the reform that we are embarking on of data protection is not putting at stake uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, safe harbor. You have seen that in the joint statement which has been um, issued. And I'm saying this because it was a concern of a number of people. We had this question uh, addressed to uh, uh, us. But on the other hand, uh, this uh, scheme uh, is not uh, infallible, or um, you know, it has is, uh, is, uh, it limits. Um, there, there are improvements which have been uh, brought up, an improvement by the Department of Commerce, improvement by the um, FTC. But let me um, concentrate on uh, the things we would like to see uh, improve for the future. First of all, we would like, uh, in a more systematic way, uh, the uh, data protection policy of these companies, which are part of the safe harbor, to be publicly available. And this is not uh, the case uh, all the time. We um, um, also have seen um, instances where uh, privacy policies do not indicate uh, the dispute resolution system, which is uh, uh, which is uh, applied to uh, to it, and uh, this is a type of uh, of issues which has uh, uh, which have to be um, addressed, and um, the this. Uh, this element of transparency, this element of uh, uh, public commitments as well, it's an essential part. So um, all in all, um, a good start uh, can be improved and of course we are very much interested, and I think it was mentioned in the previous panel, it's what going to happen from uh, to, to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, voluntary arrangements which may emerge from the uh, multi-stakeholder process, um, and of course it would be interesting to see uh, if these companies which embark into this are led to uh, respect the principles uh, which are um, uh, which are the principles uh, uh, behind the uh, safe harbors. And since we have been discussing this this morning the interoperability of uh, uh, our respective system, presumably this would be the, the best way to improve uh, this uh, interoperability further. But this is the question that is uh, asked to the US side, and I'm listening with interest what uh, the answer will be. Thank you very much. Madame Le Bayer, and now to Michelle O'Neill, who has been working with Ambassador Allen already on these issues, so another expert. <laughs> uh, unlike Francoise, um, I also have, I'm uncomfortable with the term expert, but I really have no reason to be given the length of time I've worked on it, but those of you that have worked with me would probably question the use of the term expert um, in any case. You know, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. I think that um, I, I certainly can um, understand uh, the sort of spectrum of concerns that are raised about the um, safe harbor. It's, it's a theme that's persisted since we stood this up in 2000. Uh, there are many who think that um, it's irrelevant or uh, ineffective, while others would declare it uh, an effective solution. I think certainly from, if you take a look at um, the administration's privacy blueprint that was released earlier this year, and you've heard a lot of discussion about it, uh, the safe harbor framework was identified as a, an early example of interoperability. Francois mentioned that as well, and uh, it's this interoperability I think that'll be uh, a critical part of our discussions going forward and essential to ensuring um, transatlantic data flows. The, uh, we were also gratified um, by the joint statement that was issued earlier, um, the, the USEU joint statement um, that validated um, the 
continuation of the safe harbor going forward, uh, certainly we would um, recognize that um, as our as discussions evolve on both sides of the Atlantic, um, we have to continue to be open to um, improvements and responsive to any changes in, in uh, systems as, as we go forward. But we're gratified at least uh, for today and uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, the safe harbor was grandfathered uh, in the um, proposed um, reform and uh, we look forward to continuing um, an active discussion with the Commission. Just a few of the facts um, to remind everybody of how we got here. Um, I know when we launched the Safe Harbor, there was a press conference back in 2000. We had four companies that had signed up. And I was asked um, by the press at the time, how many companies um, do you need uh, for the safe, to declare the Safe Harbor a success? And uh, I was instructed by our communications, uh, our media handlers, to avoid answering that question at all costs. <laughs> Um, by the fifth time they asked, they broke me, and I said, well, let's just say it's more than four. Um, <laughs> it was a quote that I became known for for at least seven or eight years, undermining any thought that I was an expert in data privacy issues. So uh, we're up to over 3,000. I think uh, particularly compelling to me is the fact that 60% of the 3,000 are small and medium enterprises. Uh, we often um, half jokingly say we've um, done more to ensure compliance in the small business community with the directive than any other actions uh, by the member states, but that's probably a bit of bravado. But we're certainly um, pleased that it's provided an effective form of compliance with the directive, um, particularly for small and medium enterprises. You'll hear more from some of the panelists probably about the other ways um, they've looked at compliance. But um, I, want to do, I do want to spend a couple of minutes addressing some of the criticisms uh, that we've heard, not just from our colleagues in the commission, but some of, the, some of those in the stakeholder community. Uh, we've, um, one of the criticisms that we've heard is that, um, that, self, that uh, organizations that self-certify compliance are just checking the box. Um, I would say from our day-to-day -day administration of the program at the department, um, I can tell you that companies routinely spend considerable resources complying with the uh, safe harbor principles. Um, as part of the self-certification process, uh, not only can they not merely check a box, but they must um, first describe the types of personal information they receive, explain their activities with regard to that information, identify their method of verifying compliance, provide a copy of their privacy policy, and list specific alternative dispute <coughs> resolution provider, uh, provider that is uh, available to individuals, um, these among other requirements. Uh, second criticism is that the government provides no oversight to check compliance. Um, I would say that the department always reviews uh, company privacy policies to ensure that each company makes a public commitment to comply with the safe harbor framework within their privacy policy, and companies understand that safe harbor principles must be built into their daily operations. And then that annual recertification process uh, also serves as a valuable reminder to the company in their ongoing commitment. Uh, another claim that it, um, is that there's no effective enforcement. I'm uh, thrilled that a colleague, my colleague from the Federal Trade Commission is here to discuss that aspect in more detail. We also had a panel earlier today uh, so I will leave um, that topic for further discussion. Um, one of the um, areas, too, that um, I think has been a critical part of our um, the future of the Safe Harbor Framework um, and our relationship to this point has been the um, close consultation that we've had with the Commission over the course of the um, life of the Safe Harbor, and something that we hoped uh, and, and I think are convinced will continue uh, particularly as we've discussed uh, reinvigorating our uh, privacy contact group that we established a couple of years ago under the Safe Harbor. Uh, we're also in active discussions in addition to making improvements um, uh, to including, to expanding the Safe Harbor to include nonprofit organizations. Uh, this could be very significant, so we're just at the beginning of the process of that conversation. Uh, but this would be the um, First time we've discussed expanding the scope of coverage um, of the framework since it was implemented in 2000. So I would just say that um, in closing, uh, there clearly um, much that we've learned over the course of the uh, last 12 years. Um, there are still uh, there's still room for improvement, um, but I look forward to um, continuing our discussion both with um, key stakeholders and the commission as we go forward. So thank you.
Thank you very much, Michelle. And now we turn to Mr. Jan Philipp Albrecht. He is a member of the European Parliament and he represents three states, the state of Lower Saxony, Hamburg and Schleswig-Holstein, so a lot of ground to cover. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Van Reden, and uh, thank you first of all also to the Commission to organize this event. I think it's a very important occasion and until now I've heard very uh, many interesting uh, statements and uh, also we are getting deeper into the topic instead of just reaffirming that it's important to talk about this. Uh, it's very important, it's the right time. And I was uh, really impressed by the speech given by Representative um, Markey uh, because of two things. One is, uh, he said, uh, when it comes to privacy and data protection, um, uh, he acknowledges that uh, the US side could also learn a bit also from the European side, from the European Parliament side and Commission about the debates which were taking on how to ensure this value which we all share. And uh, having said this, I thought about, okay, uh, uh, there's also, I mean, there are also many things we could learn as Europeans, which is for uh, uh, some other areas, but perhaps not the values, but uh, how to deal with them, for example, on a federal level, because we are quite struggling at the moment with them uh, being sorted out in our 27 member states and on the European level while the U.S. has already dealt with this uh, since 200 years, so we uh, can learn from this very much. Uh, but I think both of this is also connected, because it's a, uh, it's a question of subsidiarity, and uh, when it comes to the uh, data protection regulation or the reform which we have on the table now, for it's uh, especially the Germans who, who love their high data protection standards, who are afraid uh, of the federal level being regulating now uh, all this. So uh, it seems to me that there's a tension between uh, having regulated things on the very high uh, uh, level uh, and having values being ensured uh, from the view of the citizens and those who are taking part. So we have to ensure that both is taking place because uh, we have to go forward and uh, I think the only way to ensure a high level of data protection and high le level of uh, privacy pr protection, we can only uh, do that on uh, a common level, on the European, on the U US level and on the transatlantic and international level. And uh, I think that uh, over 15 years of experiences with our data protection directive in Europe but also over 10 years of experience now with the Safe Harbor uh, Agreement uh, have shown uh, mainly one thing which has been a subject to the debate uh, the whole day also which is the question of how to uh, ensure uh, compliance uh, and how to ensure therefore better law enforcement, better enforcement of uh, privacy rules, of data protection rules and there I think we really have to come forward with that. Uh, I, I don't think it makes sense to uh, say uh, enforcement in Europe is running and in the US is not running. I think we have to do our work very much both on both of the side. Um, I think it's more uh, the other point which Ed Mark has, uh, pointed, uh, all, has also pointed out, which is we are now in the post-FB era, so the post-Facebook era, which I thought it was a very uh, important notion. We are in a time where things are ch have changed very uh, quickly and where the uh, digital era is uh, more than just uh, classical data procession. It's uh, really a huge market which uh, the consumers really don't, uh, cannot really follow up with their rights, with their, with their citizens and uh, consumers' rights. And I think that it's very important to say it's not only about unfair practices of uh, companies or promises which are breached, it's really also about giving citizens and consumers direct rights which they could follow up also. And, uh, and there we really have to come forward ensuring that uh, altogether we have common standards 
uh, giving individuals the possibilities and then we have to talk about redress possibilities also of course because only if individuals have the feeling okay also if uh, my DPA or if the FTC is not really coming after uh, uh, the uh, companies uh, processing my data, I should also have the individual right to come ahead with this, like the students with Facebook. I think it's a, it's a necessary safeguard, especially in times where we know uh, we need to have uh, better equipped uh, DPAs and better equipped FTC, of course, uh, which is in times of budget uh, um, austerity, not easy to achieve. So we need those uh, enforcement possibilities, redress possibilities, and I think um, the possibility of uh, an, a binding do not track approach, for example, those things, those measures should be uh, achieved and uh, I think one, to, to, uh, to conclude with one remark, I think um, Paul Nemitz has said uh, one very important opportunity that is if there would be the opportunity now in the course of the debate on the uh, code of conduct and uh, the way how we want to go f uh, uh, forward with the consumer's rights uh, on privacy to Im implement the standards of uh, the safe harbor agreement it would be a first step to really come forward uh, to have a co coherent approach on the transatlantic level and then perhaps we are taking up the next steps uh, ensuring also legal uh, or legislative changes on both sides of the Atlantic. Thanks. Thank you very much. We turn to David Smith. David is the Deputy Information Commissioner in the UK and he is known as Mr. Data Privacy because that is the part that he handles with the UK Commission. <laughs> well, thank you very much. You, 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 you flatter me. Uh, I bear the scars of being a, a member of the Article 29 Working Party back at the time the uh, Safe Harbour Agreement was being negotiated, along with, I think, Peter Hustings, but I'm not sure anybody else in, in, in the room. And it was absolutely awful. Uh, we sat there in probably the same room that, that, that people are sat in in Brussels today for hours and hours on end, uh, discussing every little word of the agreement, trying to sort out what were called frequently asked questions. We were actually questions which nobody had asked at all. <laughs> and I have to say, you know, for us as data protection authorities, there was a huge amount of distrust. We distrusted the US side because we thought there was no commitment to privacy. And I have to say, equally, if not more so, we distrusted the European Commission. Because they, we thought all they were really interested in was a political deal with the US to solve a, a diplomatic issue brought about by the, the, the European Directive. And again, without any real commitment uh, uh, to delivering privacy. Uh, and I think, and I, well, I'm not certain, you can tell me, I think on the US side there was scepticism because I came to Washington around that time and the first question I was asked was about, you know, this is extraterritorial legislation, this is exporting EU requirements to, 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 to the US. So a huge amount of distrust, uh, an agreement reached, but we as data protection authorities were really sceptical as to whether there was a true commitment to deliver privacy whether your know, self-certification uh, would work, whether the uh, privacy programs and dispute resolution mechanisms would be affected, uh, uh, and particularly whether enforcement would ever work. We, we were very doubtful about the idea that you know, something vague like unfair and deceptive trade practices could be brought to bear in enforcement terms on, 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 on these sort of arrangements. And then in 2004, uh, there was a review of the safe harbour arrangements, which I think we felt bore out much of our scepticism. You know, some efforts had been made, uh, but as, as Francois Lebay said, uh, it showed a lack of transparency. Privacy policies often weren't there. Uh, I think from our point of view, one area we've always had some doubts about are access rights. You know, the, the right of access to your own data 
is a basic right under European data protection law. And whenever that appears in the safe harbor and other arrangements, it's couched in terms like reasonable access and appropriate access, uh, which at the very least makes us suspicious. Uh, we were also doubtful still then in 2004 about self-certification and about the, the privacy programs and dispute over solution and about enforcement because there were no concrete cases of enforcement at, at that time. So where are we today? I mean, there's no doubt we've moved on. Uh, the numbers have increased hugely. Uh, I don't want to be too sceptical, but of course you can read that in two ways. Uh, either you know, it's been a great success, because a lot of US businesses have made privacy commitments which they wouldn't otherwise have made. Uh, or you can read it that they found an easy way around what would otherwise be, be more, more, more rigorous commitments to, to deliver privacy, and so have gone down the easy route rather than the, the privacy route. I mean, I would, I, uh, I, I would be generous there. I think it is a success, and I think you know, the numbers that have signed up are way beyond what we ever thought there would be uh, 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 when we entered into to, to this agreement. We have had a, a more recent review. Uh, I, the results haven't been published. I don't know what the, the, those are. We're awaiting the, the report. But I would hazard a guess that it's along the lines of doing better now, but still room for improvement. Uh, but not to you know, wait for the official report, I did my own check on the safe harbor. Uh, highly scientific. Uh, uh, study, uh, I went to the safe harbour list and at random I picked three businesses and I didn't follow the links from the safe harbour site, I went to those uh, uh, businesses directly to their, their, their websites. Uh, and the first one I found, I thought this was great, I went straight to the, the, the top of the website, it said about our business, uh, click there, privacy, click there, and it comes to the safe harbour uh, arrangements and it sets out the privacy policy. Now, I didn't analyse it in detail, but you know, good marks there. Uh, the next one I went to, I struggled to find it, but I did get there. And when I got to the page which dealt with it, it said, we are members of the safe harbour. We have a privacy policy. Either write to us at this address or email us to receive a copy of the privacy policy, which sounds to be extraordinary given that I was there on the, 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 the website. Uh, and the third one, uh, well, I looked and I looked and I looked and I was just about to go from the site and I saw right at the bottom of the homepage in tiny little words the word pro privacy. And I clicked, well, I managed to get my mouse set over it. I, I clicked on there uh, and it did come up with you know, a reasonable description of what's going on. So, sorry, that's not a scientific sample, but it does suggest to me you know, there's a long way to go. And what, what seems to me is important is not that, that have, ticking the box, have you done this, but do these businesses that have signed up really demonstrate a com commitment to privacy? And I would suggest to you the first one that I looked at did in many ways, but the others, they may have ticked the boxes, but I'm not sure that the, 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 the commitment there. Uh, just a couple of, things, uh, 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 of points before I close. We have moved on. Uh, new FTC enforcement, which we've seen, uh, Google Buzz, and dealing with false claimants, is hugely important. Uh, it's given us confidence we, we, we didn't have before. Uh, and for the FTC's position, you know, as an enforcement agency ourselves, Publicity is important. I, I don't take what Paul Neiman said. You know, when, we, when we enforce, we make sure it's in the press and publicised because that's hugely important in sending a deterrent message yeah. to everybody else and in showing the world that we're an effective uh, 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 organisation, showing consumers and individuals we protect their rights. So uh, I, I'm on your, your, your side there. Uh, but we are. You're much more confident. This idea of mistrust is no longer there. We think the US side you know, acts in good faith. You might not agree with everything, but the, the, the faith is there. Uh, the last point to make is that, of course, this is a, a, a certification sort of system. We have in the Commission proposals at Articles 38 and 39 of the regulation proposals to do with codes of conduct 
just as we've talked a lot about the US proposals for codes of conduct, about certification, about data protection seals and marks. And actually the safe harbor is a real piece of evidence and experience that we can learn from it in, 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 in that field. Uh, and I set out you know, what, what I would see as the key elements of an effective uh, certification, you know, codes of conduct based scheme. And they chimed extremely well with the remarks Peter Hustings made earlier on when he talked about the requirements for legal interoperability. And it's this strong set of principles and rules, a real commitment to actually implement those in practice. I would add here some, some checks, whether it's audit or whatever, but something to give some confidence that businesses are actually doing what they sign up to do. Uh, and enforcement. This, yes, enforcement uh, by a regulator, but also this individual enforcement, this right of redress for individuals, which are all the elements of strong accountability. So this is all about accountability. Uh, and by delivering that, you, know, you get trust by the regulators, the data protection authorities, but most importantly, trust by consumers, the individuals this is designed to protect. All I think at the end of the day is the difficult balance, is there's a cost to that. The more checks and the more audit and the more systems you, you build into this, the more it costs money. And we are talking quite rightly about small and medium-sized enterprises, not just global businesses. So the real challenge is where the cost and trust and checks meet the, the, the right balance uh, in the, these sorts of systems. Thank you very much, David. Hugh Stevenson is the Deputy Director for the International Consumer Protection at the Federal Trade Commission, and in his capacity and um, obligation it is to make sure that the safe harbor works. So we are very interested in hearing from the Federal Trade Commission, on the, especially on the enforcement side. Thank you very much, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here from the International Office of the FTC. Um, and as you've already heard from uh, Julie Grill and, and uh, other FTC colleagues, uh, the FTC is a regulator for quite a bit about the uh, enforcement uh, activities and enforcement roles that the FTC uh, has. Um, and we've been involved in, on the enforcement side of the safe harbor mechanism uh, since the beginning. I, I personally was not involved in the negotiations and avoided some of the bad karma that David mentioned. Um, but, but was involved soon after in hearing a number of the criticism as this, as this little child that Francoise Lepay described uh, started to, to, to grow up. Um, and I would say that, that one thing to take from this is that Safe Harbor represents not just the past challenges we've seen, but in, in a sense embodies a couple of the key future challenges going forward. We had a few road metaphors mentioned earlier for, the, for how we're structuring these things internationally. And in a sense, the Safe Harbor was just of, on the information highway, those are just the guardrails for, for one lane going from one place to another. But we have this bigger challenge now, which is really more and more becoming a reality of, of building that system to go in many different directions with much heavier traffic. Um, and, and we have to have a system that really scales and, and, and meets those challenges, uh, not just in this one setting, but, but in a broader sense. And so I think in that sense, we benefited from having some time to learn from the experience of the um, the safe harbor mechanism. Um, obviously, you can think of this as having two parts. One is there's some set of obligations that companies, what they must do, what they must not do to protect consumer privacy. And, and then there are the issues about uh, that, uh, for example, Mr. Nevins and others described, the compliance or the enforcement. And of course, our role is focused on that. As, as Francois Lebois said earlier, um, if, if you don't have uh, enforcement, your, your system doesn't matter. What separates data heaven and, and, and data heavy havens is not just um, what the rules are, what the set of obligations are, but how well the environment works to make compliance with those rules the norm. And that's been one of the challenges, I think, in the, uh, the safe harbor context. And how do we do that? Well, we've heard quite a bit in the previous panel and otherwise on how we create that compliance as the norm. Environment, on one level, obviously, is having enforcement and having some kinds of agencies to, to uh, do enforcement when people don't play by whatever those set of obligations are that have been set. It's been mentioned earlier, the FTC has brought a number of cases with safe harbor counts. Uh, and I would mention there are other cases that we've brought that may not have mentioned safe harbor, but I would submit had an effect 
on the compliance environment in the United States. And my colleague Manisha Mithla, I think, described a number of the actions, including against many of the major uh, players in the United States, uh, to, to create more of a compliance culture. A second part of this is also, as David Smith mentioned, having some way of expanding that, uh, a middle layer, if you will, so that you have some way of reaching out. There are millions, millions of corporations, companies in the US and in Europe, and you have to have some way that these small agencies can reach them. Our agencies have to be smart, just as we, you never can be too thin or too rich. The regulators always feel we could always use more resources, we could always bring more cases, um, we could always try to have more focused responsibilities, but we have to deal with the resources we have. We have to figure out a way to multiply the effect we get from the resources we have. And how do we do that? Awareness raising um, uh, for the rights that people have. That's been an issue in the United States and also in the EU. The 2003 review of, by the Commission mentioned not only patchy uh, compliance uh, there, but also this, the idea that people did not know about their rights and they did not know what they could do to turn uh, to, to vindicate those rights. Um, looking forward, there is, I think, what we learned from the safe harbor is the importance of a kind of enforceable code of conduct. Uh, Mr. Nevin suggested in the last uh, uh, round whether you could for, perhaps take the sort of set of obligations of safe harbor and is there something you could do with that to build around an enforcement system that would help build those guardrails on this section of highway. Well, in a sense, a project that has been going on for some time it is an attempt to do that. The APEC cross-border privacy rules system has a kind of set of obligations, and it has um, these uh, structures for this middle layer or so-called accountability agents, um, and it has a structure for enforcement cooperation. And so there's a structure there that conceptually, I think, is very useful to think about, following up on, on his, on his uh, uh, comments earlier. Uh, and there is the importance of international enforcement cooperation. The last panel talked a lot about enforcement. From our international office, we see a lot about the challenges of enforcement cooperation internationally. And it's not always the most um, high visibility part of it, but there are challenges in working across borders between agencies, uh, even when the sort of rules of engagement or the laws are relatively harmonized. We see challenges with that in competition, in consumer fraud even. Uh, and in privacy, that's something we really need to work hard, I think, uh, to address. Thank you. And now, last but not least, to Nula O'Connor Kelly, whom many of you know from other roles as well. <laughs> um, she is now with General Electric and works in the Office of Information and Privacy and Compliance. So I am David Hoffman today. <laughs> and we're very grateful that you joined in for David. David Hoffman is Nula O'Connor. And I want to thank you so much for having me join you and uh, thank the organizers. And I want to say a special word to one of my fellow panelists. We don't get to be on panels very often, my good friend Michelle O'Neill. And Michelle and I do feel like we were there at the beginning. Of course, we were both 12, right? But <laughs> just out of high school. And, uh, and it is, I think, a little note fact, though, that Michelle was in the room with Barbara and Sue. And, and thank you so much to Armgard for mentioning. Um, Barbara, who I didn't know very well, but Sue Binns, who I had the great pleasure of, and I won't say negotiating against, but rather negotiating with. Because having been in many negotiations in life, sometimes you walk away with a higher regard for the person on the other side of the table. Sometimes then even people on your own side, but we won't mention that. Um, Sue was a great, great ally in our negotiation on the PNR agreement when I was at the Department of Homeland Security. And so with that list of a great woman. I think of the phrase, when you want to get something done, you give it to a busy woman. So with all due respect to all of our male panelists here. Uh, not that much respect, actually. <laughs> I do think, and I will leave you with the thought that well, we are about to leave I know, for the day, that I still believe that what unites us in our thinking about data protection and personal privacy is far greater than what divides us, either across the ocean or culturally around the world. And I do think also that Safe Harbor, when you think about that time in this country and in Europe, was a great achievement. It was a huge step forward. It created a lasting and durable and enforceable and, and very forward-thinking structure for uh, companies that were really stymied by the conflict of laws and, and, and wanting to do the right thing. 
And I might note also that it's a joy to talk about Safe Harbor because I, I'm sure everyone who's heard me speak has heard me speak about binding corporate rules, and I can go on equally at great length about the, the joy of being a binding corporate rule company as well. Um, both of those models allow companies greater uh, global efficiency, greater compliance with law, applicable law, and, and greater certainty in the marketplace. And so if we want to think about um, those kind of elements of moving forward, I think we are at another great turning point with the wonderful work that's being done in Europe and the terrific work that we see uh, with the administration's announcements in the last few weeks. We are at a terrific time to reach greater uh, cordiality, shall we say, and greater communication on this issue. And I think we must because companies, good and bad companies, are going forward uh, with global technology, with global business, with, with work around the world that really requires a greater global harmonization, global interoperability, not just US-EU, but the rest of the world is very much implicated here. And so when I think about the, the elements I would like to see, whether we work towards a model that, that combines a hybrid of, even of, of safe harbor and, and binding corporate rules and other uh, principles, we want, obviously, first and foremost, to provide real privacy protections. Not words, not structures, not more uh, steps and hoops for companies to, to, to jump through or for individual consumers to, to, to have to, to look through to ensure that their privacy is protected, but real privacy. And I think most of us, frankly, know it when we see it. We also want to drive good behavior by institutions. We want to create structures that are, again, permanent and durable and create market certainty for them, but also drive the kind of behaviors we want to see, the transparency that you mentioned, um, obviously statements about what they're going to do and then making sure that they do it. And then we also, I hope, all share a goal of creating greater stability and greater economic growth for all of our economies and also technological innovation. It is a great privilege to sit where I sit now in the private sector because GE is actually one of the greatest technology companies, not only in our country but in the world. I did not know we are something like the 14th largest software company in the world right now, heading for 10, I'm sure. Um,